Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Comments and Questions. This is episode three. Today, I've got some really great questions coming from the last few videos that I've produced, and I'm going to go through those. And at the end of the comments and questions, I've got a update for you where I will be going in. I'll give you a little details on it first in this video, but I will be at a local gaming expo coming up in November. So I have full details on that at the end of this. But let's just go ahead now and we'll get started with questions. And question number one comes from Kenny Lauderdale. And Kenny on uh, YouTube asked, on the last Convergence Tool video, and I'll put the link to that up top in the I above, uh, he asks, how do you look at the lens when you have to look at the back of the CRT to adjust the, he says pots, but it's actually you're going to adjust the rings. I'll show you in a second. Uh, he said he probably said in the video, but he, does it, is there any chance of touching something live or hot, basically, while you're making this adjustment? And the truth is, yes. Um, but let's first go through the adjustment. So this is what you're adjusting, these rings. And this could be the same for any type of CRT that is a picture display CRT, like a television or monitor. This is a Sony PVM, the back of right here on the CRT gun. And these first two sets of rings control the green convergence, uh, vertical convergence, I believe. And then the blue and red rings here that are the second set of rings controls the blue and red again those colors are controlled on these two rings and the way you adjust these is you adjust each set so the green set you're going to either widen the distance between the two prongs on those uh, those rings and then you'll also rotate those rings up and down the side of this yoke and then you'll just go back and forth and do that and then check the screen to see what's happening. You go, you know, you make a little adjustment and then you look at through the tool, the lens eye, and with your pattern pulled up, try to see whether it has improved your situation or whether it's gotten worse. So you have to just kind of go back and forth between adjusting the rings back here. You want to adjust the rings and then go check out what's going on on the screen. Now, I did say there is a possibility of getting a, a little bit of a zap here, so everybody pay attention if you're gonna try this uh, type of an adjustment. You see these metal heat sinks on the back of this neck board, okay? There's three of them usually, sometimes four. Most of the time there's three. And if you're over here and you're adjusting these rings, and you're looking at the front of your screen at the same time, and you happen to ground your hand against this metal, which is very easy to do because I've done it a lot, you get a little zap. Now, it's not a very big, like, electrical zap. It's going to be more like, you know, getting a little voltage, and it just goes through your hand, so it doesn't go through your body, So, but it does shock you, so it scares you, and then it really messes with your confidence going forward of making any adjustments back here. So I want you to avoid just any type of little zap. So be aware that when you make an adjustment in the back, these can give you a little zap. So you can wear some gloves and they don't have to be the big electrical gloves because this is just not, like I said, it's not a high voltage amount of current that's going through your hand and it's just going between a small point. So it's just a little zap. Uh, not even as bad, well, you know, if you ever had a kid on a farm, or when I was growing up, you used to grab the old cow fence, and it would zap you, and that's kind of what it would feel like. Not even that strong, though. It's, it's not a hugely strong zap, but again, it just messes with your confidence. So the best thing to do is to go and make a tiny adjustment on the rings, and then go and check out the screen after that. And don't try to really do them while you're doing it, uh, you, you, it's, it's not as easy, you know, to do it that way, but it's going to be much safer to go see what's going on with the screen and then go back, make an adjustment and then go back to the screen again, check and see if you're, you know, your adjustments making a big improvement or if it's not. 
but that's going to be the safest way and you'll pretty much avoid getting zapped especially if you have a really good condition uh, pvm like these or other you know high-end crts because uh, there's a lot of wiring back here but most of it for example this yoke this the other stuff is covered up well um, these points are covered up by plastic on the bat the top of the yoke and then there is a film over these copper lines that uh, that will not zap you if you touch it at all while it's running so again this convergence thing is going to be something that you're going to have to do while it's running a lot of times you'll come in here and there's not been maybe a convergence adjustment so just make sure you actually need one and if you do, come back in here, and you might even have to take an X-Acto knife and cut through some of that silicone there or whatever epoxy they may have used to bind those rings together. But it can be done, and it is worth it. And then this is another comment on the same video from Zero himself. Steve, you killed me here. I was trying to get one of these uh, tools, which is, again, the convergence tool you saw me using in that little demo, and now it's impossible. Which model did you have? Uh, I noticed there are several different models for this tool. So, yes, there were. On my model, the model number is rubbed off completely because the tool is so old. It just says Klein Convergence uh, CRT Checker Tool or something like that. And it doesn't have the actual model number visible on it anymore. The manual is a universal manual for about 12 different lenses. So, or maybe even more. You saw on the paperwork I showed briefly in the last video where uh, the, the, it lists a bunch of different models. So just note that as long as it says CRT uh, convergence checking tool and it looks like that lens, it could be a little bit different than that. But if it looks like that lens uh, and it, it works, I mean, if it's, it's just a lens. So there's going to be a lot of different brands. It's not really important on which one you get. And there's also possibly an alternative. I've been doing some research and we're looking at a thing called a jeweler's loop. And this loop is just a lens. Uh, they made some really high quality ones I saw. This was pictured for $15 shipped from like Home Depot. But if you get on Amazon, you can find these for as cheap as $6 shipped. So if you wanna just take a, a, a risk and purchase one of these to see if it's right for you, maybe you can get away with, if you just have one CRT, using this jeweler's loop or maybe this jeweler's loop glue is good enough for everybody uh, for the most part uh, i enjoy the tool i got but it was a lot more expensive than this it was you know almost 70 80 dollars shipped so they might even be more than that now so there's not very many of those left but these jeweler's loops are still made so uh, anyway check that out google that look at that wherever you buy stuff online look for the jeweler's loop and maybe I'll get one and run a test here and a video for it. Okay, so the next three questions actually came from Antoine on Patreon. And I know I've got part of his question blocked out here, but I'll read it to you. Uh, he had several questions pretty much pertaining to geometry. First, uh, grid fully visible or not? And I'll kind of explain what he means here. When you configure a monitor with 240p, should the grid be fully visible? Uh, should I stop at the red dots? It says because there's a difference if he makes a fully visible on the dot pattern, you know, when you're using different consoles and configurations. So let's just take a look here at one of the last uh, monitors I worked on, the 2030. And what he's predominantly talking about here is the space between the, um, the pin cushion on this pin cushion and grid screen in the 240p test suite. It's talking about how, how much do you adjust the geometry and where do you get your, or what's the best spot to land your overscan? Because the red area is considered to be kind of the overscan area on your picture. Now, sometimes if you pushed it all the way to the white and just had the whole red and overscan, you're going to push too much of your picture out and you'll lose a lot of your picture. So that's not really the best option. It's also not a good option to leave it where it's got the red lines really visible at all. Uh, because if you leave them at visible at all, either horizontally or vertically, now please just ignore the pin cushion problem on this where it's bowing. I'm just talking about only and the, the yoke you know, tilt. That's all part of a different repair. But uh, the, the, uh, the zone that you wanna land for is right in between this dot 
and then the red line. And I mean, you could go to where you have just a barely sliver, a barely small sliver of dark in between that white area or the uh, dark, like one or two lines, and then your red dots. That's really going to be your best overall uh, setting because Unfortunately, a lot of the 240p consoles and things like that are still going to land differently on your screen, so you're going to end up with uh, a different uh, look when you switch over the consoles. You might have something shifted a little bit left or right. That's, that's pretty common. So you just have to find a happy medium where it pretty much overscans a little bit on everything, and that way you don't really have to worry about the lines showing up where you get a dark spot or maybe a blue background line or something, because that's part of the programming on those video games. So here's a close-up of this screen, and right here is like a dark sliver of space, not very much, but that's what I usually go for, is have it almost pushed all the way out to where that dot is, uh, again, like I, like I have it here on this larger screen, pushed all the way out like that. That's really the best uh, overall setting that you're going to go for when you're trying to set up geometry and you're worried about vertical and horizontal uh, sizing. And his next question is about PAL and NTSC. And again, we're talking about straight up geometry question here. When I configure all my PAL screens, I have a good grid. But when I switch to NTSC, I have kind of a convergence issue and I have to change pin, pin amp and pin phase. Maybe it's a behavioral normal or um, maybe it's a capacitor issue. And this is something I am not entirely sure about because I, unfortunately, in uh, North America, I don't have anything that is PAL, nothing. And I never come across it. So I'm looking here at the service manual. This is a standard service manual for, uh, example, a Sony PVM20M2 or 14M4. This is pretty much the same thing that you'll find in the service menu. The number one to the number 17 items are, for the most part, geometry settings. But the first three settings are listed as for 50 deflection. So that 50 is going to be your PAL. And then the 60 is your NTSC. So that's separate, where you've got 1, 2, 3 for PAL and 4, 5, 6 for um, for NTSC. However, if you keep going down, you've got deflection again, this time no designation, and everything else is designation free. So once you get past those first six, there's no designation for the next uh, 10 or 11 settings down here. Uh, they're all going to be NOR deflection. So I feel like that here we're going to have horizontal frequency, video phase, and video size, or vertical size. Those horizontal frequency and video phase can uh, are like side to side sweeping or centering, and vertical size is the vertical size. The, those are obviously separate and on their own in these manu in these manuals and in the monitor. But I feel like the possibility is that the rest of them share these deflection settings. So. It's going to be a hard one to figure out. I'm not really sure. So, but from my best guess, on um, looking at this manual, I would think that since they share the same uh, settings, that you will probably have to make a change on each one of the settings when you switch between 50 and 60 on these shared settings. Because if there's something different when you plug it in and it doesn't look the same as it did when it had a PAL signal, then yeah, you'll have to go in and change these shared settings. Unfortunately, it doesn't separate all of them out for both PAL and NTSC. But those are just some great questions. And uh, we've got one more. Um, again, still talking about geometry. We have the 240p test suite grids. Okay, this is just the grid, again, we were talking about a couple questions ago. In 240p, there are two grids uh, with size differences. And if you've ever used the 240p test suite, you know... There's a listing on most of them where it says two different sizes. And he was just asking, well, which one's the best? And I, th I went to the website and tried to see if they had anything listed on here. But they pretty much just have one grid listed on there and said it was used to, again, measure your overscan for the most part. 
And I also use it to see how my geometry is, but it's also used to judge linearity. And it's a good test for convergence if you just want to see your convergence overall. So uh, there's not really any notes about that. I feel like there's just two there so you can get a good feel for two different sizes and see which one works best for you on your screen between the screen and the console that you're using to calibrate the screen with. And so that's it for the questions. Uh, thank you very much, everybody who sent a question. I do want to go through now the big expo announcement real quick. And that is, again, the Grand Old Game Room Expo. And I'll put a link to this down below. But this is a three-day weekend on November 8th through 10th in Nashville. And it is, um, this is either the third or fourth year it's been done overall. Uh, it's a very cool gaming and uh, arcade retro gaming. I mean, pinball, crazy amounts of pinball. I've never seen more pinball in my life than at this show, really. Uh, so it's, this is, uh, the, I think, the fourth year. And this is my second year of being there. So I was there last year. I had a booth set up, and I was there all three days. Um, and so I will be there again this year. And if you are going to be in Nashville and you're going to already be at this expo, uh, please come by, say, Hey to me, I'll have a booth. You'll see the retro tech labels and flags, and I'll have some PVMs or BVMs there and come by and say, Hey, I will just warn you that on the Saturday, of uh, the day of the actual event, Saturdays are the craziest. So they go from 10 AM to 2 AM. So if you want to come speak to me, um, the best times are going to be obviously Friday, Sunday, are both going to be pretty open. So if you want to come by and chat, I'll have plenty of time to talk. And then um, if you have to come by Saturday, you might want to do it like after probably 7 p.m. And that's when things kind of get slower on the, the, the booths and people just kind of disperse and go into mostly playing games after that point. There's a lot of cool tournaments. You can win prizes. Uh, there's, if you go to this website that I'll send the link to, there is special accommodations at this hotel where you can get a, uh, f you know, a, a nice package for pricing. I will tell you this hotel, it's not bad. Now it's not the nicest hotel. It's kind of a little bit older, but it, um, it will have pretty much a lot of things you need right within, uh, a decent distance. Like, uh, there are some fast food restaurants right around this uh, hotel, and then you are literally a mile or two away from some really good like local restaurants. And again, it is in Nashville, so you're probably within five minutes. Nashville's not as big as some of the other large cities, so you're five minutes uh, of an Uber ride right into the middle of downtown from this uh, hotel. And the um, again... I will be there, so make sure you come by and say, hey, if you're going to be there. I will be announcing some more information on this um, because I want to make sure that if anybody wants to come by and say, hey, that they get an opportunity to. But that's going to be it for today's episode. Thanks again, everybody, and leave me some more comments on the upcoming restorations. I've got quite a few more coming. i uh, still got, oh, goodness, three or four monitors that I've been working on over the past two weeks. And then uh, I'm still really getting things ready for this BVM project because it's going to be, again, the first BVM project. But um, I'm still uh, waiting to acquire one more big part on it, and then we should be able to get that um, series all started and, and getting going, and it'll be a really great uh, experience. So thanks again. I'll see you guys next time with some more retro content.